Hello everybody. <laughs> Today we've got a special day. We have a special guest. Romania uh, is our first guest from UK. The first guest outside of Kiev mm -hmm. So uh, it's the very nice for us. I'll be going to tell you something about energy to reaction. It's very interesting thing. It has something to do with Chile public because one of the two founders of this, uh, one of the two guys who actually, actually first of this technology, or of Carolina, is actually born in Carolina, so he's in Czech. And so... He does the hard work, I mean. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know yet. Yeah, so, please, welcome Bob. My first three weeks in California, uh, I was uh, interesting. I arrived on a plane and I got picked up by a colleague uh, who works for this project, the uh, Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, which is about three and a half years old now. Hello. Hello. Are you joining us? <laughs> yeah. Good. Where, where, where are you from? Rudolph. Right yeah. And you're studying? Uh, energy engineering. Excellent. Great. <laughs> okay, so we're all on the same page. Uh, and so I got picked up by my colleague and taken to his garage where I've just spent the last two and a half weeks. Yes, there's Santa Cruz. It's like where the wetsuit was invented. It's one of the best surfing destinations in the world. And I'm in a garage for two and a half weeks. So you have to really be interested in, in, in what you're doing and I am interested in what we're doing. And I'm so interested I'm willing to do it and not get paid. <laughs> But what's really fascinating about this is, um, so Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons in 1989, they uh, announced, because some other group was announcing some more successful new and catalyzed fusion, they were about to announce, uh, announce it. And uh, uh, so they were asked by the University of Utah to bring forward the, their research and, and make it public. And uh, um, then George Bush Sr. Uh, uh, requested all of those people that were currently uh, being paid lots of money to research hot fusion um, to spend a couple of weeks seeing if they could replicate it. <laughs> now, if anyone knows a little bit about material science, when you have two of the world's, uh, well, when you have the world's preeminent uh, electrochemists and the guy that uh, basically invented surface and parts for and scattering, um, uh, spending four or five years developing something and you get a load of people that really don't want this to be real <laughs> and you give them a load of money to basically say it's not real, effectively and they're not going to come up with the right answer and to be fair to them, it was really difficult because what you're about to learn about is something that's so multidisciplinary uh, it involves mechanical, electrical, material science, uh, uh, physics, uh, chemistry uh, Every, every single field you can imagine, uh, you need to get right to get this, these systems to work. Um, and what I'm talking about here is now called low energy nuclear reactions, although there are about 20 other different terms it's called. Uh, depending on the scientists, there's maybe up to a... There's more theories than there are active researchers in the field. Um, something like about 130 different theories. However, uh, I've been speaking this morning to a guy called Francesco Piantelli. And Piantelli was uh, on August 16, 1989. Uh, it was a hot summer's day, and it's in, he was in the Universita de Siena. And he was doing a biology experiment. And this biology experiment was learning, uh, trying to establish the chemical changes on a, a, a neuron from the brain. Uh, that cause it to die when it gets starved of oxygen. And what he had, he had a little blue sort of piece of aluminium with a little glass window in there, and he had a small nickel rod. Outside there was this incredible spectacle that they run every year, where all of the different districts of the city, they compete on bare horseback, right in the center of the city, uh, and people fall off and injure themselves, some people die sometimes, and they run around with everyone in the center of the city. He's there, he's doing the science. And what it is, is when your brain gets some of oxygen, uh, the, the chemical, the, the, the brain cells trying to defend themselves by releasing a chemical that uh, protects them. And if 
if you don't get oxygen quick enough, it releases too much of this chemical and then it blocks oxygen from being able to come into the cells. And what they were looking at is to find out what the chemical changes are so they could develop drugs in order to prevent this from occurring. Uh, and you can get those drugs now and do a mountain climbing and so on. But this was 1989. And so he had a, a, an electric current pass through uh, this nickel rod such that it would keep this brain cell or group of brain cells alive. And it was in a, 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 a you know air or oxygen atmosphere. And then he would flush it with hydrogen, and that would start the time of dying for the brain cell. And so a period of time after the, the start of death, then he would flush it with liquid helium, which is about the coldest stuff known to man. Does anyone know how cold it gets? Bang on! <laughs> about 1989, um, it didn't cool the nickel rod. In fact, the nickel rod kept boiling this liquid helium that was coming from a cryogenic system that was putting 250 watts of cooling into the cell. It's an itty bitty little nickel rod, and it's just boiling and boiling and boiling, and he goes, what the hell is going on here? So that started a journey which meant that he worked every day, nearly seven days a week for the last 26 years. Um, and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him last year. Uh, last week he received his master painting for Europe. Uh, this painting describes the, the principal process that I'm going to take you through. Uh, it is his particular understanding of the science, but he worked uh, over the years with a range of scientists and uh, also with uh, some of the leading uh, physics scientists were a guy called Sergio Riccardi, who's now sadly departed. Um, he was the uh, 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 professor emeritus of, of physics at the uh, University of Bologna, which is one of the principal Italian universities uh, that study physics. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about how do I phrase this? It's, it's a kind of new type of energy. It's, it's the same as every other type of energy. It's like it's mass conversion. Um, uh, and it, it is nuclear or it isn't, depending on which theory you, you read. Um, <laughs> the, the, the technologies that you see that seem to be closest to uh, delivering are either um, looking at finding a lower ground state of uh, the electrons in hydrogen, or they are looking at some sort of reverse MOS power process. And uh, does anyone know what I mean by MOS power? Okay. Uh, anyway, it's, it's there's, there's there's structures of the atom and there's energy levels, and you can use it for analysis. Anyway, I'll I'll get to some more basic stuff. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the project is. Uh, it's a collaboration of organizations, so we're not just individuals, we are research groups, we are universities that collaborate with us, uh, scientists, and uh, even government bodies. So, um, off the record, several government bodies will email us and say, you know, well done chaps, or, or no, you're talking rubbish, uh, <laughs> things like that. And the primary goal is to show the world there is a, a new practical primary energy source that we call the new fire. The reason we call it the new virus is just like the old fire, but it's just a lot better. It doesn't get any smoke, it doesn't use anything radioactive at the beginning. Hopefully, if you get fuel right, there's nothing radioactive at the end, and there's no dangerous, serious emissions uh, during the, the, the process that um, creates the mass of energy. So, how do we work? Uh, we uh, use the internet, basically, and we conduct what we call live open science. So. We were publishing on YouTube real time and on a, a Google um, Drive, all of the data from loads of different pieces of equipment real time. And we had uh, crowd researchers around the world analyzing that data as it was coming out and suggesting what we should do next in the experiment. 
So it's a, it's a really interesting process. It's not something that a lot of universities can do or individuals can do because they're always wanting a patent out of it or they're, they're always wanting some sort of closed research. But it, 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 it's accelerated our uh, ability to catch up and, and in some cases overtake other researchers in the field. Um, I was very frustrated the way science was conducted and uh, um, uh, with lots of research groups doing the same thing and, and then they publish something and, and other people go, yeah, well, we knew that and, or we were working on that and we've done it this much further or something. A not-for-profit organisation um, and uh, yeah, so that's a load of rubbish there. Um, there's just some milestones. You can probably get this presentation. Uh, now this wasn't the presentation I wanted to give, by the way. It's just one you've got. Um, uh, okay, so um, so for chemical, you know, if you take carbon and, and oxygen and you make CO2, you get about five electron volts of energy yield. Uh, fusion, traditional fusion, deuterium and tritium uh, goes to helium and neutron. Uh, yield 15 mega electron volts. So there's a, a huge difference between 5 EV and 15 mega EV, right? So of course, uh, if you want something to power the world, you want the one on the right, not the one on the left, Let, regardless of the global climate change or issues. Uh, so this is uh, Piantelli, he's at 83, 84 now. Uh, he wears this very lovely uh, fedora. Um, and this is one of my researchers, he's from France. He's French, but he's okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, he's the guy that first came up with this. This is his lab, uh, which is somewhere in Tuscany. <laughs> That's what I can say. Um, and it has a lot of cool equipment. What's right there in the middle is um, a, a polytetrafluoroethylene case and one of the reactors will go in there and that allows them to constantly slow down if there are any. Just it's a precaution. And there's experiments running around there. They've got an SEM over here and, and a, a spot of the deposition in the corner. Um, okay, so this is the patent which has now been extended. It was granted on the 24th of July and then one of the other competitors uh, challenged it and uh, uh, he then had it annulled and then he challenged it and he's got it back again. This is a company called Unified Gravity Corporation in the US. Uh, this is one of their reactors. Uh, they've been researching for about 10 years. And uh, I will come on to one of the fundamental parts of this technology. Um, but they're employing this. Now, in, in 1932, it was predicted in 1929, but in 1932, uh, uh, two guys got together at a university in Cambridge, I think. Uh, and they did an experiment, I might, I might have that wrong, somewhere in the UK. And uh, they accelerated a proton into lithium, 7 lithium, and uh, it fused with it, making beryllium, which decays very, very quickly into two, 4 helium, 2 4 heliums, or 1 helium and an alpha, which doesn't electron capture. Basically, you get um, about the sort of 15.6 or 16.7, something like that, mega electron volt. So it's similar to the deuterium tritium output. And it was the first time that uh, we split the atom. Actually, we, we fused it and then we split it. Uh, it's a neutronic fusion, there's no neutrons involved. And uh, it proved Einstein's theory. Uh, and so that was the first one. They, they, one of the guys was Irish, and it's the only guy that uh, won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, they both won the Nobel Prize for doing it. So what you've got in here is you've got a, a proton accelerator going. That's a proton, it's a, who knows what a proton is, you know what a proton is, right? the center of a hydrogen atom. Uh, and, uh, and that is accelerating into the, the vacuum chamber. Uh, and in there, there's either, well, in this case, it's probably a, a substrate with something that emits lithium atoms. And it, it hits there. And they say that with, I think this piece of apparatus, you put one kilowatt of electricity in and you get um, uh, alpha particles coming out, and because they're charged particles, you can generate electricity from them. They're claiming something like 16 uh, kilowatts of power out from one kilowatt in. Okay. Now they have the longest patent application in the world that I've ever read, and it has research is done in labs all over the U.S. But what they found is you don't need mega electron volts 
uh, to split the atom. In their case, they found you need 222.6 electron volts. Now you think, oh, that's a lot lower, but it still represents millions of degrees centigrade on the actual one particle. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a, a lot lower, so they found a sweet spot for um, the interaction between protons and, and, and uh, lithium. Okay. So that's the painting application. You want to read it? So this is a very current, colorful character on the left here. Uh, Andre Rossi is very controversial. And uh, on the right, you've got two guys from the University of Uppsala. And down on the bottom there, you can't see them, but that's a guy that's a Russian researcher uh, and his granddaughter. <laughs> so um, he took Piantelli's um, uh, uh, research. And what Piantelli's research says is that if you get nickel, you get it in a very certain way, at certain nanostructures, and you treat it to a certain temperature and change it through phases, you can actually get hydrogen to disassociate on the surface, uh, a heterogeneous lease, you get H minus and H plus. And the H minus, if you then excite this certain crystal lattice in a certain way, uh, you get a separation between the valence and the conduction bands, and that allows this H minus, which is a proton with two electrons, like a, a, a virtual electron, uh, a heavy electron like a muon, to, to collapse into the shells. He like, calls it a shell, shell catcher, um, and it, it's not using the Bohr model of the atom, it's using quantum mechanical models which are more like this kind of shape that go through or very much close to the nucleus. And this allows, in, in a muon catalyzed fusion, it's 207 times larger, the, the muon than electron, and that allows your uh, uh, hydrogen isotopes to get 207 times closer, and then they fuse even at, you know, four degrees or five degrees. Except it doesn't, doesn't create net energy because it takes so much energy to make muons. Okay, you, it, right, right now you guys are receiving muons, quite likely. And that's from protons that come from outer space, and they're, they're traveling at terra electron volts. They hit the upper atmosphere, and they, they cause this cascade of pions and kaons and so on, and they fire muons down at you. So you are exposed to muons all the time, but uh, in not great numbers. <laughs> but they're very high energy. <laughs> okay, so what he did is, uh, uh, Piantelli did, is he found that sometimes the proton gets, uh, the, the virtual electron, the proton with two electrons, gets captured into the nucleus. And you get a transmutation through decay of nickel 58 to 59 to, to 60 and so on, until it gets to nickel 62. And that's the happiest element I suppose in the universe. And it doesn't want any protons, it doesn't want any neutrons, it just says, just go away. <laughs> Um, the other outcome is that the proton gets ejected, and I don't know why, because he hasn't quite told me, but it's up to 5.6 mega electron volts that these uh, protons can get ejected. Now, what did I tell you about the quantum uh, gravity corporation? How many electron volts does that use into lithium? 222. You've got a good memory, haven't you? We've got the two bit, anyway. So, <laughs> 222.6 uh, uh, electron volts. So you can have a whole range of energies that come out. So he, you're having these protons coming out, and what, what Rossi did is he had this piece of inspiration to add lithium to this mix. And so you have liquid lithium on the nickel surface, that there's hydrogen in the system as well, and occasionally these, these protons come out. Okay? Now the first part of the energy, which is what Piantelli first discovered, is only producing a COP of about 1.1. And we've done research on a couple of different systems. One is another researcher called Francesco Cellani, and he uses a wire, a piece of constantine wire that's a copper, mixed with uh, nickel, and you, you dual heat it. it. It gets larger, it oxidizes, you get this nanostructure forming on the surface, and then you reduce it, and it looks like a sponge about 20 micron sponge on a 200 micron wire. That, that's one, we, we've done lots of research with that in the early part of the project. Um, the second one is the, the, the nanostructured nickel, and if you, if you only get 1.1, that's not really very interesting, is it? I mean, it's amazing, that is what the ITER wants to achieve what, sometime in the future. <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe 20 years from now, they want to get to 1.1. 
Okay? But um, it's 1.1 on a small scale. Um, but if you can get some of those protons, which can be stopped by skin, can be stopped by a bit of paper, but if you can get those protons to interact with the lithium, then you're getting your, your 15.6 mega electron volts. And you're in a system where you've got this sea of lithium around you, and the lithium is the fourth best uh, heat capacity thing in the universe <laughs> that we know of. And, you know. And, and so it's able to absorb the heat very, very quickly, and hydrogen is number one. So you've got hydrogen in the system, lithium, you can dissipate the heat from those events uh, very readily. Rossi's, Rossi, actually, his claim to fame is one, one he kind of invented the, the creation of biodiesel, you know, how to make biodiesel from waste. And the Italian mafia put him in, in, in jail for that, because <laughs> they couldn't get rid of their waste. So, uh, he's a very controversial character. And right now, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, he finished testing a, a reactor, a one megawatt reactor, using this technology, which he has a patent for, will probably be challenged and thrown out, but he does still have a patent for it. And uh, he has been running this reactor for a year, and it completed, and the claim is it produced a COP of 50. So it's producing one megawatt for one fiftieth of the energy in. And he used picograms of hydrogen in the process. And some lithium. The challenge is that the company invested in him, which raised a lot of money from a UK company and has got the Chinese to put up 200 million to build some factories in, in China, along with the Chinese government, uh, they uh, don't want to pay him the 89 million that they're due because this experiment was a success. They spent a lot of the money they raised in buying the patents from all of the other researchers who no one's been listening to for the last quarter of a century. So they use this guy's infamy to raise a load of money and, and so on. But if he's talking bullshit, he's raised them a lot of money with it. <laughs> so, um, very controversial characters. There's a hundred million dollar lawsuit right now going on in, in uh, uh, federal courts in the US. This is the, one of the reactors. This, I think it has like a, 110 uh, reactors in there. I think they're around about 30 kilowatts a piece. Uh, there's three reactors in there. They're 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter by uh, one centimeter thick. They're plates. Uh, they have tungsten around them. And uh, we discovered why <laughs> in one of our experiments. He'd been making lots of claims for years that, that it produces um, photons of around 0 to 100 kilo electron volts. And this is the sort of photons you might get if you go for a dental x ray or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, we accidentally showed that he wasn't lying. <laughs> we didn't expect to. Um, I'll, I'll, if I can, if it's on the internet, is it? Is it yeah, it is. Yeah, at some point I want to show um, the, the experiment we did uh, in California. So this is his patent. Uh, this is a very controversial reactor as well. Um, it, I, I would have brought it today, but it's in the office. So I have an exact replica of this because we ran experiments to test whether the Swedish scientists and the Italian scientists had got it wrong. And they did. <laughs> they used a, a bolometer, which is an, a, an infrared camera, to look at the reactor. And uh, they, the, 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 the outside coating on that, in fact, most of it is made from alumina, aluminum oxide. And uh, if you speak to anyone in the heat treatment business, they'll say the hardest thing to determine the temperature of in the whole heat treatment industry is aluminum, aluminum oxide. Because it's emissivity, the way that the light is, comes off from the surface, it, it's uh, very difficult to determine. Uh, and they got it wrong. They used historical data and then they, they didn't properly calibrate it. So they claim that the reactor was producing, a, you can see over here, a cup of something like 3.2. We think it was probably more like 1.6. Um, uh, but the very interesting thing is 1.6 megawatt hours over 32 days. That's what they claim. We reckon it's a lot lower than that. But anyway, it's still a spectacular number. The other spectacular thing is this. Natural lithium is composed of 92.5% uh, lithium-7 and, and the rest is lithium-6. 
If you want to make nuclear thermonuclear bombs, you want to make, uh, get lots of uh, lithium six. That's, that's what the Russians and the Americans did for a long time. Uh, and several lithium has other uses, like stopping proton, uh, neutrons, but thermal neutrons, very slow ones. Um, anyway, so at the start of the, the, start of the experiment, it had natural ratio, approximately. At the end of the experiment, it, it almost inverted. So something had happened to the lithium. Either it's gone away, or um, you know, it's all converted into lithium-6. The nickel, interestingly, is natural ratio, so you've got 68% six, normally uh, of uh, 58 nickel, and, and so on. There's the ratio on the left-hand side. Uh, on, the on, the, on the right-hand side, there's almost no material other than nickel-62. That's freaking crazy. <laughs> that there is, is really incredible, because this reactor is running at about uh, somewhere between 1200 centigrade and, and 1430 centigrade inside. That's what we call low energy, really, in terms of nuclear. Uh, I mean, people say that, that we are trying to recreate what's happening on the sun in, in ITER. It's absolutely bollocks. It's complete bollocks. Because how can we do that? What, what's the big error there? Why are we not doing what's in the sun? The pressure. Temperature. Pressure, kind of. Yeah, gravity. Yeah. <laughs> we only know 1% of the way chemistry works in the whole universe. Because we deal at pressures we can create on, on the surface of the planet. Most of the universe chemistry occurs at gigapascals in the center of planets. I mean, people don't know, but it takes about a million years for a reaction in the middle of the sun to actually get to Earth. And then the hot bits of the corona. <laughs> and so it's, it's like, it's, every time they say, oh, we're trying to create the sun on Earth, it's bollocks. We're not. We're trying to create something that doesn't exist. Which I think is funny when they say, well, this doesn't exist. It's like, well, okay, but this doesn't exist as much as yours doesn't exist, except you've been spending 400 billion on it since the 50s. <laughs> and you still haven't got anywhere. Okay? So this, this is really interesting. And this is not the only example. Lots of researchers in this field have discovered um, uh, uh, isotopic uh, anomalies. And one of the... Uh, most interesting cases is uh, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. In 2013, they were awarded a painting they've been waiting something like, what is that, 13 years, 12, 13 years. And they're taking, with that painting, they're, they're, they've got like um, layers of an insulator and palladium, like 20 microns or 20 nanometers thick, something like that. Uh, that's a big order of magnitude there, but anyway, <laughs> you can look at the painting. And there's a couple of layers of these, and then they put on the top surface uh, an isotope of a uh, non-naturally occurring isotope. So it can't be something that was, you know, from the environment. And they put that on the top, and then they diffuse deuterium through it, uh, and then they fire a laser at it. And they get two deuterium nuclei added on to, say, tungsten, and they end up with platinum. Or they start with cesium 137 and they end up with chrysidinium. Okay, so it's transmutation, it's alchemy. Ah! ah not alchemy! <laughs> so they're very interested, obviously the Japanese are very interested in this because they've got half of their main island covered in lots of really nasty stuff called plutonium, which has got a quarter of a million year half-life. Um, <laughs> so they're quite keen on getting this out underway. <laughs> One of our researchers discovered uh, uh, two bacteria living in nuclear fuel pools. And they can eat radioactive material and spit out non-radioactive material. And as he announced this, there's some other researchers elsewhere that, that uh, found a similar thing. So there's a whole school of these researchers that are saying there's nuclear reactions happening in your body. People wonder why you can eat a, like a, a silly chocolate snack and then go for several marathons. Well, you can do the math, but there's just something not quite right with that. And uh, there's, there's a, a researcher, a French guy, in the 1950s, and uh, he was um, 
in line for the Nobel Prize, uh, and he got it taken away from him. And basically, he was taking chickens who normally had calcium in their diet and replacing it with another element, and finding that if you took calcium away, their, shape, their eggshells were just like squidgy and you know they weren't hard. But he gave them another element. I can't remember what it is but now, but if you gave them this other element, they then started having hard shells again. And so the chickens were converting one element to another in their bodies. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of heresy going on here. <laughs> but uh, Mitsubishi is tried and tested, and they, they actually got their painted because Techno were a part of Toyota replicated them. Uh, there are many other researchers there, and one, one I've just actually recently come across. And this is an experiment, you know, if you know someone in the right apartment, they might want to do it. Uh, you take a substrate, you vapor a, a, a sputter coat and nickel onto it. And then you hydride one, that's, you know, you put hydrogen in it and so on. And then you expose both of them to a laser at a kind of glancing angle. It's a specific type of laser, and if anyone's interested in doing the experiment, I can point them to the right paper. This was done in 2003, the paper was published. And what they found was, is that the copper 65, which wasn't there before, but it was there, but it did a little bit, uh, increased by 1,680%. It's not, that's not a small amount, is it? It's a, it, that's a lot. And all they did was expose, they exposed two, the two surfaces, one that had, uh, was hydrated and one that wasn't, to three hours of laser uh, uh, you know, um, impinging on the surface. Three hours only. And the one with the hydride, 1,680% more, copper 65. And the other one, there yeah, it was just the same as it was before. <laughs> And so what you've got is you've got the proton gets captured into the, the nickel uh, uh, and it, it goes and decays and you end up with, with copper 65, which is a stable isotope. Does anyone know where you find copper, by the way? Where do you find copper? In wires. In what? In wires. Wires. Uh, in wires, no! I mean in the earth. Where do you find it in the earth? Okay, right, so copper is found in volcanic plumes, domes, in volcanoes, and in sulfates and carbonates that are from volcanoes. What is the mantle made of? What is, you know, the, the hot shit underneath down there? What is it made of? Nickel uh, iron. Bingo! So you have naturally occurring nickel. And out of that, somewhere, magically comes naturally occurring copper. And it's only in volcanoes. Where does helium come from? Where do you get helium? Like you have a private. Where does it come from? No, no, no. Helium's too light. It floats up in space. The helium you buy to make a balloon go like. The balloon. It's got helium that comes from the US Strategic Helium Reserve. And over 60 years, they extracted that helium from uh, gas deposits. Okay? And so the process that creates oil and gas does not create helium. But helium gets trapped in a, in a deposit that can get trapped gases. Where's it coming from? I'll give you another place, and this is another clue. What you, where you, the only other place you see helium on Earth is coming out of volcanoes. So I've held this belief for a long time that, you know, basically the same reaction we're discovering here is going on and keeping the Earth warm. And what you've got is you've got a huge magnetic force, you've got Coriolis forces, electrostatic forces, and it's hot, and it's under pressure, and it's got hydrogen in there, it's got nickel in there, and you get copper. And you get heat, and it keeps hot. This science is revealing so much about how the world works. Here's another another thing. Where do you find aluminium in the world? Volcanoes. No, it's a good try. I get the conversation. I know. <laughs> okay. No. 
Um, so uh, the Russians did this research. Uh, like, if you want to really know a lot about science, you need to learn Russian. And I know that's not a great thing to say in the Czech Republic, is it? <laughs> um, but they've done some kick-ass research, and there's a, uh, an Italian guy called Alberto Carpenteri, and he looked at some old uh, Russian research. And what he found was, is that whenever there was an uh, earthquake or something, neutron counts went up, and it went up for a long time and then died down again. Okay? And they explored this and they looked at the Mediterranean, and they found that um, areas of the Mediterranean Sea have got different salinity, uh, sorry, um, acidity, uh, alkalinity, depending on how active their, uh, the seismic areas are. So you get a different uh, acidity depending on like if you're over by Greece where there's lots of earthquakes. And what they found was, uh, well essentially all of the big iron deposits are in the centre of continents. And this is something that since I was five I, I read the Encyclopedia Britannica, as you do when you fly. And I was why is this? Why is all the aluminium on subduction zones, and why is all the iron in the middle of continents? It's like if this was like came out of the primordial soup. Why did it end up in specific places? It confused me. And so I was at this presentation in, in ICCF uh, 18 in the University of Missouri, and uh, the guy did this presentation and it basically explained it. So exactly what you have is, and this is the Russians found this is that you have magnetite, which are like super lots of iron in it, uh, and you brittle fracture that. You don't ductile fracture, you brittle fracture. You get a thing called uh, um, fracture fission, and the iron splits into two aluminium. So when you have a subduction zone, so you've got one tectonic plate sliding on another, and you've got an iron deposit here, you get these fractal, fractal fissions and you get aluminium created. So you, you get bauxite on the edges of continents and stuff. If you follow this theory to its logical conclusion, you do not need meteorites full of water to put the water on Earth. The water comes from factual uh, 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 fission. It builds up a lot of oxygen and, and uh, uh, you know uh, hydrogen in the atmosphere, and, and you end up with a cataclysmic event that creates the water on the Earth. So this science is really opening up a lot of understanding of how, how the history of the, the planet occurred. There's a couple of different explanations. I thought there was 130 theories or whatever. These are the two main ones. Uh, uh, Seven lithium plus a isotope of nickel goes to six lithium uh, plus uh, nickel. So the neutrons are being, there's a wonky neutron on seven lithium. It's like, yeah, I'm on the go. And, and uh, it gets like taken away. That's one theory. Favored by the University of Uppsala. Um, and uh, the, the second one there is the same one that we saw in 1932, which is celebrated on this 2015 15 euro Irish coin here. So I'm coming back now. Remember, I said one proton goes into seven lithium, produces two alphas, and a shitload of energy. <laughs> there you go, it's got the names there Ernest Walton and John Proctor. Uh, this is a chap I visited in uh, uh, Moscow. The, the Russians aren't so scared about this technology. So I visited this guy, he's called Alexander Parkman, and he did a study where he has like a radar dish in his communistic block, just like your panel axe here. He's on the 14th floor, a little bit taller than some of you. And uh, it looks like something out of a steampunk movie, and he has a strong 290s. Uh, uh, Source in there. And what he found over something like 28 years, he, he worked for Rosatom and Prior and the Russian nuclear authorities. Um, and he's got like, this computer that looks like it's from the 80s, and the only thing he does is collect the data from this <laughs> device. And he's written a book about it, it's like this. I've got a signed copy. <laughs> um, what he found was is that neutrinos can accelerate the decay of uh, radioactive isotopes. 
And he found that uh, during the course of the year, as the, the, the Earth moves around the Sun, uh, the amount of rate of decay of radioactive isotopes, uh, like strontium-90, it's a, nearly a pure heater emitter, um, uh, increases as you get closer to the Sun. And of course, the distance from the Sun relatively doesn't change the amount of neutrino flux coming from the Sun. What's happening is, as, as the Earth gets closer to the, the Sun, there are neutrinos coming from the cosmos, from the birth of the universe or from other events in the, in the, in the uh, celestial bodies. And they come in and then the gravity of the sun pulls them in to, you know, the gravity pulls them in and you get a higher flux in the sun. And it accelerates the decay of uh, neutrinos. So this guy is super respected in, in Moscow. So I went, I went there and I didn't quite know how, his respect, how much you were respected. It was a lecture hall about maybe three times the size of this. And it's in the, the Friendship University in Moscow. And you think, oh, that's not really a serious university. It's got the word friendship in it. <laughs> it is one of the top two theoretical universities in like, all of Russia. And there's this guy, he's about this big. He's called Dr. Samsenko. And for the last 20 years, he's been running an open session where people can come in with their crazy ideas <laughs> and put them across. And I was one of those people <laughs> coming in, giving my lecture. And uh, I was talking about our research at the beginning of last year where we showed that the Italian and the Swedish researchers had not properly done the uh, lunar emissivity that I was telling you about earlier. And, uh, uh, and that we devalued the excess heat figures. And at the end of the presentation, um, this guy kept asking me really good questions. I thought, this guy knows his stuff. I said, so, you know, there's some good questions in the book, but this guy knows his stuff. And then I, I, I did an experiment with, I went and saw some other researchers, and they had a system where they're using titanium hydride, and they pumped five bars of hydrogen through it every time. Uh, they did that, they got, it glowed super bright, and they were in fused quartz. And their idea is to make a motor that runs like this. You, you, you generate enough hydrogen, and you pump, pump it through, and it, it creates pulses. So then they're, they're focused on making a motor. That was in North Moscow, and I got around to this guy, and we did this experiment there, and uh, it was in his house. <laughs> he's, he's got his lounge table here, and he eats here, right? And then you walk over here, and these, these are the real distances. And here is a lamp. <laughs> That's where he eats his food. And here is the lamp. And his dog's walking in and out. <laughs> and he's got this reactor here. Uh, and uh, he was seeing a cop of, you know, more than two um, in this reactor. And he was boiling water. He was pouring water in and measuring the amount of water that was boiled. And, and just assuming it got to 100 degrees rather than the vaporization energy. You can, you can make a lot of errors when you start looking at vaporization uh, 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 energy. And uh, so. It, there's his results. It's got, it's got, it's got a CFP of 2.5 in one experiment. And so I, I left Moscow, and, and two months later, I see this news headline, and the guy that was asking me the questions has announced a 30-year program in Russia. I mean, the Japanese have already restarted their research into this field. The Indians have got an all, as much money as you need research program started there. And the, the Russia goes, right, we're going to restart our research program. 30 years, they're going to have a five year crash course. And the guy announcing it was Dr. Alexander Provenov. There's a guy asking the questions. He's the head of all new Russian nuclear research. <laughs> I go, oh shit, man. <laughs> and I said, what did they say? I don't remember what they said. <laughs> so, so the guy, there's, there's me there with uh, uh, Alexander. Uh, and this is when uh, the 19th uh, semi annual conference into this research. This is in Padua in Italy, that's where Galileo came up with the scientific method. Uh, and uh, the guy I was talking about who was doing this kind of designing this reactor for making like an engine, he's the guy here, Sergei Godin. Uh, and the guy on the left is Alan Goldwater, who I just spent the last two and a half weeks in his garage in sunny California. By the way, guys, when you finish your degree, I didn't do this, but I should have done that. I've been there. Get yourself over to California. 
Really, shit is going down there. <laughs> you know, we're running this experiment and we've got like a, an $8,000 from about the 80s microwave sensor and it's going <laughs> in certain parts of our experiment, you think, oh, it may, maybe it's producing microwaves. And so we put a call out on the live YouTube stream. Has anyone out there got a, you know, a microwave spectrometer? And two hours later, a guy who ran compact computers as their technical director for 19 years, <laughs> he turns up in his Tesla Model S, all super shiny, and pulls out this really expensive piece of equipment and says, you want one of these? <laughs> it's fucking crazy, man. Everything you've got on your smartphone, that's why I asked the question earlier, is being made within a few, few tens of miles of them. You're driving around the motorway and it's like, oh my god, every, every brand name you can uh, And it's not just in the uh, I, 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 uh, IT section, uh, it's also in engineering. The, the stuff they're doing at Stanford, uh, really, you know, once you've got your degrees, go and do your masters there, uh, and everyone's driving around and, Bugattis, and it's just, it's surreal, it's so fucking surreal, I can't even tell, imagine, I can't even get across to you how surreal it is there. I mean, it's, it's like walking into a car showroom. <laughs> just, just cook your own food there. I mean, a, a small apartment's like, well, even in Mountain View, uh, it's like one bedroom and a, a little lounge, and a, it's like $2,000 a month. Um, but that's cheap, because that's my friend who was staying there. He said that the other apartments are renting for three and a half thousand dollars, same size. But you can understand because it's just it's amazing what's going on there. So this is our reactor. Uh, it's basically an aluminum tube. In fact, it's a malite tube, which has got uh, silicon dioxide in there and magnesium oxide and so on. But really, it should be aluminum. It's high temperature. Aluminum kind of. What's the temperature of melting of aluminum? Well, it's in excess of 2,000 degrees. So we're only taking our reactor up to about 1,500 degrees. That is still really difficult. A lot of things don't like those temperatures. You know, I, I guess in your power engineering, you're trying to keep things in the hundreds of degrees. You don't want them to get that hot because insulation starts failing and dielectrics start breaking down. And, all kinds of nasty stuff happens to what you're planning to do with your system. So, it doesn't necessarily need to work at this temperature. Because when I was um, presenting our first results on December the 14th, 2012, and I was in this military base in Rome, I was like, bit, 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 bit. and <laughs> we had our experiment running on this laptop at the back of the room. Uh, and it was running in France. It was our third attempt at replicating Chalani. He sends us the wires and we just tried to replicate, replicate his procedure. I kind of left the room, I'm walking out of the room, like this, and I hear this heavy footstep step chat come up to me, like this, and I'm, I'm just casually walking out. And he taps me on the shoulder like this. You need to add an alkaline metal. Of course, an Italian accent. I go, uh, what, you mean like lithium? And he just smiled and walked away. <laughs> and that was it. He was like, woo, that was a bit weird. <laughs> um, and of course, in, in 2000 and last year, I kind of just started to really seriously understand what's going on in the process. And I published deliberately so that it couldn't be patented, although Pian Telly has now put it in his painting that he's now been doing. But um, if you add uh, cesium or francium, these things kind of melt at uh, body temperature. Okay? Now the trick is, you remember that 222.6 electron volts? If you get lithium and hydrogen and you put them into a combination, you get lithium hydride. Remember I was saying the Piantelli's process early? You, you, you have the hydrogen come down, it splits heterogeneous, so you get H plus you get H minus, there's the proton and two electrons. You want to get that into the nucleus. In lithium hydride, it is Li plus H minus. It already is what you want. And there's shitloads of it. But more than that, if you go to the Unified Gravity Corporation, they have a version of their reactor which is a hydrogen, uh, uh, sorry, a proton uh, lithium 
plasma. And in that, there, that version of the reactor, all they do is they have an electrostatic field and the protons smash into the, the lithium-7 nucleus. Okay? So that's effectively creating the plasma. Now there's other research done in Germany in the early uh, to mid 2000s that discovered that with uh, lithium hydride, it is effectively when it's in a liquid state, it's what's called a liquid plasma, where the electrons aren't associated with any one nuclear nucleus of, of an atom. So it's the same as what we're seeing in the Unified Gravity Corporation, uh, but it's in a liquid, and that gives you 500 electron volts of screening from the seven, uh, uh, seven lithium nucleus. Now, lithium hydride melts at 788.6 or something degrees centigrade, which means you can only really start seeing excess above that, because that's when it starts to be molten. Unless, of course, you have much less hydrogen. And then it melts around about the melting point of lithium, which is 180.5 degrees C. But the fucking crazy thing is that cesium and francium and lead can't melt at 27 and a half and 38 degrees. So you can melt these things with your body temperature. Now that Italian general, when he came up to me, he said, you need to add an alkaline metal. He didn't say I needed to add lithium. I said lithium. I spent two years trying to get any of my researchers to add lithium, and they only considered it when it was in the Rossi painting um, in uh, late last uh, year, uh, the year before, yeah, 2014. I tried for two years <laughs> to get them to add lithium specifically. Anyway, if you add a little bit of one alkaline, group one alkaline metal to another, they will become liquid at much lower temperatures. So you could end up with a situation where you can have a reactor that you could turn on with your body heat. And we discover that these reactors, they release soft uh, uh, um, X-rays. You can use the soft X-rays to generate light, electricity or heat, depending on what you do with them as they come out. So you can have a device that produces electricity, produces electricity, produces electricity, and it'll keep on doing that, and it'll keep on doing that. Or you can put something over it, it produces light, or it'll produce heat, and it'll keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, until it's really pouring, and you're five years later, you get to chuck it in some water and it turns off. So you, you freeze the alkaline metal. And right now, Rossi is claiming that he has these uh, reactors. Uh, I don't know. Like, like, you know those dry board markers? That you, you know, some of the electrodes might use them on a white wall. Yeah. yeah. About that size, and it produces 100 watts, and he can make it produce electricity or light or heat. And I predicted this last year. And now Piantelli has it in his painting. If this is real, and we're trying our hardest to establish whether they're a bunch of liars or it is real, but we didn't expect to demonstrate that it is real from a point of view of the radiation coming out. I mean, if you've got x-rays at 100 keV, you can stop it at 1.1 millimeters of uh, tungsten, or like 3, 2.6 millimeters of lead. These are very easy things to, 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 you know. I'm much more scared of the gas boiler in my house, you know. That is a bomb that could produce carbon monoxide and kill my children, you know. I'm much more scared of the, the, the petrol in the car. And <laughs> you know, that you drive driving on a bomb. <laughs> you know? So, so this technology will change everything. And you cannot, if you were in my head, everything about the whole world looks great now. There's no problem at all. We just need to fix the technical side of things. Okay? So this, this reactor takes about a month, about hundred dollars to make. Um, so we saw a, a gamma emission, uh, which normally, sorry, okay, let me get this right. It's, there's a, does anyone know the difference between gamma and x-ray? Right. Yes, and no. Uh, so gamma is not only something that comes from the nucleus, but you can get gamma level energies from not from the nucleus. 
And so, yes, generally people would say it's because it's, it's higher energy over a certain point. Um, and before we saw the supposed excess heat come in on, on the, the 1st and 2nd of February this year, um, we saw this big burst of now We didn't know that until the 16th of February when we started analyzing the data. In fact, it was a guy in Italy who, you know, he's agoraphobic and he can't hold down a job, but he's a brilliant analyst. And so we published the last of the radiation files on, on, and a couple of hours later he sends me this uh, email saying, what the hell is going on here? And it shows this trace, it's like, oh my god, uh, we've seen this. And what happened was, is Chalani, that researcher, we did a lot of research from the beginning with, he went to Rossi's first demonstration in Bologna in 2011, and he was sitting about seven to eight meters away with two battery-powered Geiger counters. Like, well, what, one was a, a, a scintillator, which can tell you the energies of the photons coming out, and the other one was just like a Geiger counter. And he was just getting them set up. He's there with about 30, 40 other scientists ready for this presentation. And suddenly, both of them went full scale for like about a second and then started dialing back up for about two minutes. And they all panicked, all the, all the scientists panicked. They said, look, he's got a nuclear source in there. This is, the, the scale of this energy is so huge that they, they all considered running from the building. And then the door opened and Rossi said, the reaction started. <laughs> and so they came in the room and it was, Charlie said that the reactor was about 50% more than background. It's quite high in, in, in Bologna. It's uh, I to count a minute or something. Anyway. Um, so then, essentially, what, what happened was, that during the excess heat period, we saw uh, this energy of 0 to 100 kilo electron volts. And Rossi had been saying this for the last six years, is what comes out of this reactor. And from this energy, we, we established that he'd need five centimeters of lead. So I went and spoke to a journalist who went and visited him. And it turns out that's exactly what he had in his reactor. So, if he was doing a fraud, he was quite, quite uh, amazing that he would predict that nature would show us something four or five years in the future that would justify his reactor designs in the, in the past. It's quite a clever guy. <laughs> now, Peter Tully told me that, you know, a man may lie, but nature cannot. Okay? Nature cannot lie. You might not understand it, you might not have the right theories to explain it, but it's telling you what it will always tell you under certain circumstances. And you have to remember, people say, ooh, you know, these things don't occur in other places in the universe. Well, how do you know? I've already explained it occurs in chickens and, and under the earth. <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, we are creating something that is very unique. We are we are using the MOND process, where you take carbon monoxide to uh, convert raw nickel into high, highly purified nickel. And just like a snowflake, depending on the weight at which you cool it and the pressure at which you cool it, you get different snowflakes of a different size. That's what happens in the MOND process. You get very specific structures that can vibrate in a very certain way. And this allows the process to occur. And you're putting in certain purified elements. And these things don't just happen out there randomly. <laughs> But in the centre of the earth, there's, there's so much shit down there that you don't need much of it to happen for a lot of energy to release. So yeah, we caught the end of the carbonate. That was a bit risky of us, wasn't it? <laughs> How does it compare? Ah, uh, well, you know, everything else has got pluses and minuses, but you know, for, for low energy reactions, it's all positive. So there, I'm trying to start with wide-scale research. We work, we've had some Chinese research bodies replicating our open research, and then they've gone a bit more full-scale. Um, they've got better results than us, but we don't know if they're lying because they don't publish their results live. <laughs> it's like quite scary when you're running an experiment live, like the one we were running in California, and I said, right, I'm not happy with what my uh, thermal imaging camera only seeing the front. I want to see what the temperature is on the back, because if the temperature is cooler on the active side than the null side on the back, then it kind of nulls out our result. Okay? So we put in a specular reflector on, on the back side, and it's like when we're heating it up, we're going, ooh, it's not that much different. It's not that 
and then they started to separate. Um, and so we're desperately trying to not prove it. <laughs> and with each little iteration, it gets a bit closer. But, you know, um, the radiation for me is a big tell. And I have images, and I, I can give you the website at the end. We did see some neutrons. Uh, we saw two types of neutrons. Uh, fast neutrons and thermal neutrons. Fast neutrons are the sort that you get from this new one that comes down into your leg, which is shielding our um, scintillator, and it causes some reactions in there, the nuclear reactions that fire out some neutrons. And these things are super fast. And we have these things called the uh, bulb detectors, and they are uh, produced by a Canadian company, and they're designed to only, they've got super critical fluid in there that goes poof when a neutron goes through it. But they have, um, and it's very visual, so we had it on a camera, and in, for some nights, we just had bubble watch. So we had people all around the world just looking at this thing going, is the bubble coming out? Is the bubble coming out? What about now? <laughs> because the, the, the fast neutron detector for like a week or two when we were doing calibrations and loading the nickel with hydrogen, um, that was producing like one or two bubbles a day. So, you know, you've got to watch it one time to get hit. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't see anything in the thermal neutron detector. And it's only when we were going through the initial heat up that we first saw. So, so this thermal neutron detector we'd owned for, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks since it had been delivered. It would never seen anything. Then we're warming it up, and bang, we're seeing neutrons. And I, I, it's like the middle of the night, it's live on YouTube. I'm going, ah, ah, shit, come in here, there's a neutron, there's a neutron, like this. And it comes in, and I've got my head, like, about this far away from the reactor, and I'm looking at the neutron detector here, and whilst I'm looking at it, another one appears! Oh, look, there's another one! And my head's here! <laughs> of course, it's like, it's a silly number. But, um, you know, Parkabov, we were talking about earlier, that uses the, the, the typical way to look for neutrons and to determine their energy is to use a helium 3 isotope in a chamber, and the neutrons go in there and produces uh, like a, an energy signal that you can determine. Uh, that there's been a neutron. He's seen a lot more neutrons. In fact, there's a, there's a guy about your age, uh, when I was in Korea for the first uh, going to nuclear conference I went to, in the Materials Keist uh, Materials Institute in Korea. And this is another simple experiment you can do to test this. So you, 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 I'll give you three now. Nickel coated onto a uh, substrate, hydride laser. I can give you that paper, you can do that one. Rock crushing. With the bubble detectors, you can see neutrons from that. Uh, and the other one is, uh, what was I talking about? Go on now. Step back, help me, help me. I'm student in Korea. Yes, yeah, student in Korea. See, you are listening. There's at least one person listening. Good. That makes me happy. Um, <laughs> so, he got palladium and he loaded it with deuterium, right? And the way you load it, you get heavy water, deuterated water and you put electric current through and that forces the deuterium into the blade. And he gets that and lifts it up, puts it over, but he doesn't because he's not stupid. But anyway, he gets a, pro a means of lifting it out of the place where it's getting deuterided and puts it into liquid nitrogen and he gets thousands and thousands of neutrons. So this is low energy nuclear reaction. This is freaking freezing. <laughs> it's liquid nitrogen. And what's happening is the lattice and the blade is going like that. And it's crushing you. So that's, that's an easy experiment you can do uh, to just get you set over the hurdle that these things are possible. So, yeah, in your guy called Mahadevan Sunarathan. So, we've been working with uh, Song, Song Ching Jian in, in uh, uh, China. His latest reactors, it's not published right now, but um, he's got lots of little tube reactors. And uh, uh, he's seeing. COP of about three. Um, I don't know, <laughs> a guy called Matt David Srinivasan is leading the Indian research. He did the, the original research of the quantum flight and published in 1989 with the Babri Atomic Research Center. Um, and they, I met in 2013 in India, because I had a company there and I was working there for eight years. Uh, I met the head of the Babri Atomic Research Center and I said, blah, 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 we're doing this. He says, oh yeah, we did research into that. It was interesting. 
They produced some excess heat, but it wasn't commercial. And they were just doing palladium deuterium, which is what everyone was doing at the time. So Billy Tetley says it's any transition metal and hydrogen. And it's to do with the electron shell configurations. Uh, in, I, I, I won't talk to you. <laughs> uh, the unique thing about transition metals, it isn't the S shell that, that does valence. Isn't just the S shell. Uh, the S shell is the one that's like furthest away from the nucleus. Okay. If it was the XL, the XL is like a sphere, uh, even in quantum mechanicals, it's the same as it is in the wall. Uh, but the D suborbital orbitals get very close to the nucleus. And in transition metals, it's the suborbitals, the D shells, that uh, do valence. And that's why you can get various different types of uh, oxidation states of chromium, for instance, and nickel, and so on. Um, and this allows, because the, they go to close to the nucleus, and because you have the H minus, the proton with two electrons, is 1830 times, around, roughly, uh, larger than, than a normal electron, you can get so much closer to the nucleus. It gets so close that it's in within five fem femtometers, <laughs> which is not a lot of distance. <laughs> it's really very close. And in fact, for nickel 62 and 64, Bohr would say it's actually already in the nucleus. When you calculate its mass, it's already there. <laughs> okay, this is because Bohr is a little bit so anyway. Um, it's a rough calculation. So the Russia started and Japan started. So the next conference, if you want to go to it, I've just got an email about it today, the third email. It's in Sendai in Japan, which is nice because if you fly to in Tokyo, you have to drive through Fukushima to get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get like loads of our guys and going to bring all our radiation monitors and going to do like a, a Fukushima tour. Uh, so, brilliant light like power. When I was with Piantelli, and what happened was, is uh, Piantelli said he was going to die, and that wasn't very good because he like held the key. So I managed to raise $10,000 in seven days and bring people from seven different countries in, in two weeks <laughs> to visit him and we spent a couple of weeks with him one-on-one -on -one. we filmed it all in HD <laughs> and he still cleans up to a point and in that time, he, you know, remember those 130 different theories? Well, the, the main theory is he then spent a whole one of those days basically rubbishing them and he tell he's like one of these old scientists he was uh, uh, he has a, a library and it's about that big, right? With books like, you know, the things that people used to read. They're on the shelf. And they were going back like in at least, you know, more than a hundred years. And so he would have piles and piles of books in it and he would say, I don't know why people think they're discovering these things. He says, nickel hydrides at 71 degrees, 111 degrees, 167 degrees, blah, 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 and it's been in there since the 60s. This work's already done, you don't have to rediscover it. And, is it, and, and this one, these people that have so much experience, you cannot even, you'll never be there. I'm sorry, you won't be. You've got specializations, and he's one of these people that's a theorist as well as a practical scientist. So anyway, he goes through all of the different theories, and he's rubbishing them one by one. He says, ah, oh, this particular theory doesn't even include the wave function. So, you know, it's, it's not even real. <laughs> you can immediately dismiss it for that, et cetera, et cetera. And then the only one he gave credit to was a guy called Randall Mills. And for 25 years, he's raised nearly 80 plus million in his research. He has a whole theory about how hydrogen, hydrogen has uh, 137 different states below the ground state, and they're in 22.7 electron volt steps, and these can be yielded with a catalyst, which is a transition metal. <laughs> uh, and depending on the transition metal, um, you either get more electrons out or, 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 or x-rays. That's the way parts of these processes work. But anyway, he published, and I want to try and show you this video, um, but this is the reactor. I've got two slides there. Okay. So, <coughs> what, what does that look like to you? If you can see what's going on there. You can see what's going on there. Right, on, the, on the left, you've got a green and a sort of yellowish 
bottle. Uh, one one's water, uh, deionized water, and the other one's hydrogen. And then you can see the ignition system manual. I don't know if you can see that on the, the top left. And there's two like kind of fat blocks. What they are are pieces of tungsten. Why would we choose tungsten? Yes, and that comes later in this system. But the tungsten has got the highest melting point of any uh, solid element. Uh, and this thing gets fucking hot. It's got two electrodes, and uh, you can't see it in this shot, but you'll see it maybe in the video. Uh, there, there, you see there's an inductively coupled heater. There's some like split couple uh, cut wires. That's, that's a series of coils that are probably water coiled, cooled. Uh, and they use induction to heat about a pound of silver, like half a kilo of silver, uh, to its melting point, which is 988 something around there, degrees C. And they push using an electrostatic pump, either the hydrogen or the water, through it. And Monson Silver has a, quite a nice property about it, like it's all water, it seems a bit weird in your head, but anyway, it does. Um, and, and hydrogen, and that comes squirting through these two electrodes, and they've got some supercapacitors, and 2,000 times a second, they've got 2,000 amp discharge at very low voltage through this, and what that does is it does a couple of things. It splits the water, and it ionizes the, the silver, and vaporizes it, and one gets smacked into the other. And Pierre Telly, during this time when he was with us, this was a year ago, he said, this is actually in January, into February, January 2015. He says, now Mills, he's the one. And he pulls out his theory, which is stupidly big. He pulls it out, and he flips the things, and he pulls out one sheet, he says, but he's got this wrong. But, as I say to people, you know, if I want to make a paper plane, and my dad tells me how to make a paper plane, and I start off with a piece of paper and I fold it, and I fly. I don't know why I was doing it. I don't know how it's flying. I just know that I followed some instructions and it flew. And I can maybe get it wrong and it will still fly. So the thing is, people don't need to know everything about something to be able to make a working embodiment. And what I will show you in a minute is, so the electrostatic pump, which is, you know, no moving parts, goes through the, mold, uh, the uh, induction heater, which has no moving parts. And it sprays this combination of either hydrogen and silver, molten silver, or water and molten silver through this. It produces um, uh, a kind of plasma, and that produces soft x rays. Ooh, I haven't heard those before. Um, EUV and UV, okay, which are all types of photons. And the company was originally called Black Light Power until they made this reactor. Now the problem is with black light is it's really difficult to convert that to electricity because people are only making solar panels to convert visible light, which is black body radiation like you get from the sun. So there's something that the ancients knew, and they made ceramic pottery or glassware, and they used nanoparticles that was like silver and gold. And we're back to something that Fleischmann discovered, which is you know, or, or explored, which is plasmon, surface plasmon. And these uh, are the way nanoparticles interact with light and produce waves of electricity on the surface that can change the property of the light that's impinging on them. And so what happened is, is the, the high energy photons, what happens is the silver comes up, it's in a plasma, then it's condensed into nanoparticles. And the nanoparticles are exactly what you need to convert the X-ray, the UV and the EUV into visible light. And so when you see this demonstration on YouTube, he doesn't tell you how this works, but I worked out how it works. Um, and by the way, this is the guy, the only guy that PM10 gave credit to, and one year later he's showing the near working embodiment, which is only part of the technology, but anyway. So it, 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 it comes out, he says, right, at the moment it's just producing X-rays of UV and EUV. And then as the reaction proceeds, uh, he says, this is a cloud of silver vapor. And then after a while, the vapor gets a little bit further away from the reactor. And one of the presentations he's showing is he's literally just dropping down through the electrodes into a space outside of the fridge. And what happens is that then the silver vapor condenses into nanoparticles, converts the light into visible, and over the top of that bowl there, he has a tungsten dome. And this absorbs the remaining 
high energy photons and the invisible light that's being created, which is incredibly bright. It's, it's like looking into the sun with binoculars. <laughs> Not a good plan. It's incredibly bright. So um, then they can use the standard type of solar panels that you have on a solar collector. These are like one, two thousand suns. They hope to get them to three, four thousand suns. So you can have like parabolic reflectors in your field, and they reflect light onto these solar panels, and they can take like two thousand. So they're, they're like this big. They can take the equivalent of two thousand times that area and convert that into electricity. Okay. And so what he does on the top of the dome is he has these uh, solar panels. He's working with the latest solar technology. And then what happens is a very small part of the electricity is generated, it comes around, is stored in an accumulator, which might involve the lithium battery, just because it's good at that. Um, and then that drives the electrostatic pump, the super, the super capacitors, and the, the uh, uh, induction heater, and closes the loop. So it takes quite a bit of energy to start, so you have to mount the silver, and you have to start the pump, and that's not a lot of energy. Uh, and then the solar panel, so it's about, uh, the, the bulb is about this big, and the rest of the amber, so if you imagine this podium here, and, and you just draw a line down here, that is about the size of the reactor. Take a guess at how much energy it produces. Just guess, just have a guess. One minute, all right. Within the ballpark, yeah. 500 kilowatts, 24 hours a day, and a shitload of heat that you have to get rid of. <laughs> and it's closed loop! <laughs> it's, it's so incredible, it probably doesn't exist. <laughs> but I can show you the video, and there's a lot of military people in the room, so. And it's the only guy that P and Tony gave credit to, and one year later he showed them in their working embodiment. And this is so simple, you could probably build it here. Really. The supercapacitors aren't that expensive. You make your own induction heater, you can, you can design the power electronics guys, you can make an induction heater, right? Yeah, it's like pretty standard. And electrostatic pump, well, you'd probably come up with that. Someone in the machine shop could probably cut a bit of, you know, with a laser or something that's good at cutting tungsten because it's pretty nice and difficult stuff to cut. Have you tried to build it? I would love to build this reactor, but it, the, the presentation that the video I'll show you is from the 28th of January public presentation. So it's very recent. A lot of this stuff is snowballing now, and part of it is because of our project. The, the purpose of the project was to get everyone to lay their cards on the table. We, we said from the beginning we didn't necessarily have to do it, we just had to make other people think that we were going to do it. <laughs> and then they would have to show what they were doing. And because they started showing what they were doing, everyone's either working faster or having to show what they're doing. And the point is about us working in it. So we have 20, we supported nearly 20 researchers. We've got two in Ukraine, two in Russia, uh, two or three in Sweden, one in Norway, Germany. Uh, three in Italy, uh, one in France, or two if you count John Bulgari, um, about three or four in the uh, US, and one in Canada. And then the, 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 the Chinese and the Japanese and the Russians just keep an idea, and the uh, Indians just keep an eye on what we're doing. So I'll come back to that. Um, well, maybe, maybe I can do this. Is it connected to the web? Oh, is it the web? What about the WordPress? And the blue one. The blue one, this one here. No, no, no. no. This middle one? Yeah. Not this one. No, no. Not that one. No. Oh, yes, this one. Okay. <laughs> am I going to get sound, dude? I'm not going to get sound, am I? Am I going to get sound? Can I get sound? No. Is the sound the sound? Not. This one would be very impressive. I can make the noise. <laughs> January 28, 
Ian Taylor's painting was granted on March 20th, 2016. You see it's quite bright, but that's like, you have to be careful because I don't know if you know, if, when you have like a webcam or something like that, they're very sensitive to IR. So the, it looks brighter than it is. So, you know, when I look at this, I go, yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> we know this because when we're running our experiments, we have to get like infrared filters and put them over our webcams so that they actually see something that's closer to the actual color that you see in your eye. Of course, our eyes might be being filled with x-rays and I'll get out cataracts in two years, but anyway. You know, it's not that important. Oh, oh okay. Control the flow 
of all the plasma downward away from the PV. So we can run that under a vacuum and run direct to the PV with no window and use the high energy light. So we have that program going on as well. You see that? So the plasma is not going up here as it was before. It's all being ejected down. So you get the initial flash, but the uh, plasma uh, fragments go down. So these are some of the parts, and we have those up here, and then the magnets come to get us in the and the heat um, I mean, man is talking through the structure and there's quite a lot of dis disclosure. He doesn't talk about the theory so much and I can help people out with that. We have uh okay. So they called Chalani in, the researcher that we're working to explain why the most expensive piece of equipment ever built had stopped working. Uh, and so yeah, so Brunelin now have a technology that's producing about 4.23 COP in the gas phase and 2.13 in the liquid phase. This is a, they use a, a fast DIDT, you know what that is, right? The power guys. It's just turning on a lot of current at once. What they're doing is they're loading up the lattice of, of material with the hydrogen or the deuterium, and uh, they, they then put a shock through it, a uh, very, very high current shock, and the shock causes like a, a ripple down the, the, the material and, and uh, creates the... They have a different theory of how it works. They think that the protein goes to deuterium, goes to tritium, goes to the other bit, and then the human. Um, I'm not so sure that it's right. <laughs> uh, and this was uh, 14th of October 2015. Uh, what you see on the, there is Vittorio Villanti, who I was talking about, did that experiment in 2013 where you saw the 1,680% increase in 665 only on the hydride nickel plate and not on the non hydride nickel plate. That's Vittorio Villanti. And he's now, well, Bill Gates is meeting him because Bill Gates loves nuclear. He has his own, uh, not, not as part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he has his own research funds that he's put into what's called the Traveling Wave Reactor. Then we got very far, he started investing in 2006. Uh, he gave a presentation in 2010, October or November, and uh, he says, you know, my company is really strange because I have two types of people in my company. I have these 60, 70, 80 year olds and these 20 somethings. <laughs> and there's nothing in between. Because someone in General Electric made a nuclear reactor for a submarine and they go, oh, well, okay, we've done it. And then they convinced everyone in the world to make the same reactor. <laughs> and so nuclear research stopped dead. And for obvious reasons about nuclear reactor. So yeah, so Vittorio Valenti there, um, uh, and uh, yeah, Airbus, they were having a meeting. This 
this is a long slide, sorry. That's the thing about that's the thing about pocket deposits and, and iron deposits, you see, you know, where they are in the world. So we have to thank Francesco Giovanni because uh, he uh, enabled us to start the project because we are we're at this conference and everyone's dying. So Fleischmann died three weeks before the conference and you know they're all getting very old and, and uh, we said look you know we can help you a bunch of guys and we want to do this live on the internet but we need someone to give us your technology so we can test it and Francesco said okay you should just be really safe though. Uh, our project is funded by donations. Uh, one of the biggest donations has come from uh, the staff or from their bonuses of the license for Bobcat in Sweden. So they all sacrifice a bit of their bonuses uh, to help the project. Um, and many private donors. This is our project on Bone when we were uh, testing the Lugano reactor. That's the one that uh, used you know, so called COPF3 over 32 days, one and a half megawatts of electricity, energy by the heat. This is in Minnesota. This is our, how we molded it. Everything we do, we publish exactly how we do everything. So, you know, if anyone's interested, they can re repeat what we did. We went to a lot more trouble than they did. We had uh, a Williamson, Williamson IR, that's producing a little uh, laser spot on the center there. That's the, the world's best way of measuring the temperature of at Alina. Then we have the thermal imaging camera, the Optris over here, and that's a good camera. And again, it was broadcast live. It's, it's interesting because we ran an experiment called Bang, uh, uh, which I, I won't have the video. Um, that's the apparatus there. But this is the aftermath of the, the reaction, and live on the internet we had an explosion. <laughs> In our learning research, it's like this. This even got onto lots of different forums. I had a guy I've spoken to for 15 years saying, oh, "I just saw you on my nuclear thing," and that was definitely your So what, what you have there is a sintered rod, and that's the nickel with the lithium and the aluminium. Um, it was probably just a pressure effect, but uh, it was interesting all the same. Um, and so this is the power that we put in there. Veil 255. It's the same stuff you have in nickel metal hydride batteries. Uh, this is what it looked like afterwards, and we discovered a hell of a lot from this. Uh, it was probably around about 1,200, 1,300 inside, which is approaching the melting point of lithium, which is 1,333 C at one atmosphere. Um, and what you can see is that the, the filamentary nickel, the failed 255, which is not optimal for this process, Sinters together, and that's what it does in your nickel metal hydride batteries to create a, a, a regular structure in order to, uh, um, you know, accept uh, uh, ions. And uh, what's coating that surface is this molten mixture of lithium, high uh, uh, aluminium, uh, and uh, so the actual Rossi fuel mix is lithium aluminium hydride, which we now know we should be separating. We shouldn't have it all together. Um, and the lithium actually dissolves nickel. Lithium's really nasty stuff when it's a vapor. I mean, it's, it's very nasty when it's a liquid. <laughs> it's very difficult to contain. <clears throat> In fact, actually, the, I'll give you a tip. The only thing that can really hold back lithium is pure iron. Steel's not too good, but pure iron. Um, so, that's that, and that's that. And I want to show you, uh, uh, to close out, our, our most recent experiment. Um, uh, this is talking about how the process works with energy bank, gas bank, and oh, 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 oh. this is surface plasma on polarotons. Oh, that's the nickel again. This is, uh, da, da, da. This, this is interesting. So there's a couple of different ways this works. Um, what you need to do is you need to create oscillations that are big enough to separate the combustion and valence bands so that the H minus can be captured uh, into the nucleus. Because if you have two atoms separately, the, the uh, band structure is all separate. If they come closer together, so their the energy levels are all separate. If they come closer together, they go into bands. Um, uh, and on nanoparticles, you have, you know, I was talking about nanoparticles earlier. The, the, both of these presentations, if you can give it to them, um, that would be great. They, they can look at it. There's lots of links to other work. So when you have nanoparticles, you can have electrostatic fields multiplied by 10 times. 
Electrostatic field is very good for accelerating ions. So if you've got a proton that's got a positive charge, you've got an electron with a negative charge, and you want to get a proton to smash into lithium, you know, and you've got nanoparticles, then you know, when they've got electrostatic charge, they can go 10 times more influence. You've got NASA there. They're talking about using surface plasmon plaquetons to initiate and sustain. They've got a research program uh, into this. When you start looking at this, you're like, who hasn't got a research program in this? <laughs> Um, so yeah, depending on your shape of your nanoparticle, it depends on how it responds to light. Um, so this, this is all real cutting edge research. So this, this is a material that might be a very good material. There's a Danish university that's synthesizing this. Um, to, if you imagine you want the H- to slam into your nucleus of your transition metal as fast as possible, you would want the more, most massive uh, isotopes, and I talked about nickel 62 and 64 being preferential of isotopes of nickel. And our next experiment, we bought some nickel 62. Anyone has a guess at how much that cost? A lot. <laughs> 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 Anything more like a guess? <laughs> Very good. On the figure, not on the quantity. <laughs> so the quantity. It cost nearly nearly a thousand dollars for seventy milligrams. <laughs> In fact, between asking for a quote and, and placing an order two weeks later, the, the inflation in the price of the nickel sixty two was more than the price of gold. <laughs> Just the inflation. So yeah, it's and, and <laughs> So my, one of my scientists in, in Texas, he's just sent a so sample, he took a little bit out for analysis, but he, he said it's so small you can barely see it at the bottom of this really miniature pile. <laughs> uh, what you're seeing here is you, you've got uh, nickel uh, and uh, you are mixing it with a, a platinum and it produces this PTNI3 uh, and this is a, a, a rhombic dodecahedron. Uh, and then you put it through a process and you end up with uh, platinum skin on nickel with an open frame. And there's a pr program in the US to try and create catalysts to be better at removing um, you know, carbon monoxide and ni nitri nitrogen pollutions in, in fumes from vehicles. And this exceeds their, their goal by 2020 by something like 10 or 15 times. So they already achieved the best thing they wanted and, and, and far beyond it. But it's interesting because in Rossi's painting, the preferred embodiments are group 10 elements, of which nickel's at the top and platinum's down there as well. And why? Because they are the heaviest of the, the, the transition metals. Okay. More massive for those that are more scientific. Uh, okay, and that's the paper on the... Um, Changes. So I just want to show you the experiment and then we'll close down and I'll take any questions. So if you want to think about the questions, uh, think about them now, not time finding the website. Um, Quantumheat.org. I'm sorry, but I had, I had the last time I developed the website before I developed this three and a half day, three and a half years ago, in four days, uh, I had to type in all of the control codes. <laughs> so uh, it's a bit shit, but uh, it was a minimum viable product, quantum heat. It's not that shit, I think I've got a bit missing here. <laughs> okay. So our latest experiments was at 5.3 here. And hopefully this works. So, what you have here is an LMD7317. This is about the most sensitive Geiger check tube you can get. Uh, down here, here, you have a cadmium telluride uh, 3 to 100 keV uh, dual stage Peltier cooled head. Uh, uh, and that's about $8,000 to $11,000 worth of kit. That was fortunately loaned by the company that makes them just down the road from where the experiment was. This is a lead shield, and behind here we have two neutron bubble detectors. Uh, this was uh, uh, loaned to us by Stanford Research Labs, uh, and it's an X-ray detector. And it's a very um, thin uh, 
and small uh, sodium iodide crystal uh, with a beryllium window. And that, what you want to do is, um, when, a, when a photon comes in, it gets multiplied and produces a signal, it gives you an idea of what the energy of the emitted photon was. And beryllium, beryllium is the, 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 it, the, um, the sodium iodide is hydroscopic, so it absorbs water from the environment and breaks it down. So you need to coat it with something. So it's coated with beryllium, which is, is the lowest uh, capability to stop uh, photons. Uh, up here is the webcam, the overhead webcam with our wonderful IR filter, which is a pair of IR glasses. <laughs> it's just taped on there. Uh, this is the Optus thermal imaging camera. So we're actually looking at basically this is the, the active side, so the active side, with two thermal couples coming off it. And this is the, the null side. Uh, this is an aluminium foil, uh, stopping radiation from changing the thermal response of the main sodium iodide detector that's in this lead well. That's just a whole bunch of lead bricks. It's a heat and heat there. Um, and that is essentially, oh, there's an overhead camera over here. I'm going to zoom in there. Up there. That, that does the overhead shot for the experiment. And this wall of cables and stuff, that's the broadcast computer there. So we've got a, a very high density pixel screen there and put it all on. Uh, anything else on this? Mm. Not really. So that is the experiment. Um, any questions? Any questions? How did you go? Hmm? How did you go to experiment? Um, very well and bad, because we saw neutrons. <laughs> and so, I hosted a guy, I actually have a house here, and I live here in my family. Um, uh, and he came from, he used to work for the Soviet Interstellar Space uh, uh, Propulsion Research Program during the Soviet era. And he kind of defected and ended up going to Cuba and then went and spent his, the rest of his career from 92 in our uh, University of Toronto pursuing his research. And uh, he uh, came up with a theory based on his structural model of atoms. A guy's called Stoyan Sarkachev, Stoyan Sark for short. And uh, he showed that with um, uh, if you have lithium attached to a transition metal substrate, uh, it aligns itself under the structural model of the atom with a helium nucleus and a tritium nucleus on the end. And when you get hydrogen, come, uh, a Rydberg state of hydrogen coming in, it knocks and the neutron comes off a slow thermal neutron. So he predicted this uh, a, year, a year and a half ago. And uh, it might account for the transmutations of the nickel, because if you add a nickel, another neutron uh, to nickel 58, you get 59 straight away. So the, new, the, the transitions you saw might be because of that. Um, and the first time this was reported was another researcher that we collaborate with here in the Czech Republic. Uh, he's up uh, near Chesky Trishan, and uh, he works out of his smoke, smoke house. <laughs> you know, he smokes, you know, he used to smoke like pork and stuff and fish. Uh, but he's converted into his uh, outside lab. And he said, oh, I, you know, I've seen, I said, you know, you need to get some neutron detectors, and he got some, and, but he didn't know the timing. But in this experiment, we were recording the neutron detectors, and s several other people watching it have actually identified specific times that the neutrons appear. Maybe I can show you a picture of that. Um, so very successful from that point of view. It would seem that the active side produced more excess heat, and we have more confidence with that. But the level is so, so low right now. And we think that uh, if you, Piantelli, uh, well, Violanti showed that with just three hours of laser radiation, you can create a large proportion of transmutations to copper 65 in 2003. In Ficardi and Piantelli's painting in 2004, they said you preferentially want nickel 62 and 64. And Rossi is claiming that he enriches his fuel with nickel 62 and 64. So this is why we bought nickel 62, because it's centrifugally produced from uh, nickel carbonyl, uh, carbonyl nickel. Um, we thought we would get a load of 64 with it, but when we've had it analyzed, we only get 62. So we're just, the next test will be with nickel 62, and we will be enriching that four times from natural, which is 3.6% normally natural. Nickel, and hopefully it's a non-linear response. So we'll, at the moment, 
we think we have seen around about 20% more heat out than, than energy in. Um, but, you know, we, we have low confidence on that. But if you have a nonlinear response from, you know, doubling, tripling, or quadrupling nickel 62, and in, in my understanding of the theory, the nickel 62 will just produce more heat, it won't actually transmute. Um, you, you will, you will, maybe you will get copper too, and if you do, it's a great kind of deal. And it'll all be live, so uh, the whole point is that this technology is so transformational that, uh, and we were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize two years ago because we're doing it openly. Um, there were another 47 nominees that year, so we didn't have a pet. <laughs> no chance of getting it, but anyway, we were. Um, uh, and uh, basically, uh, this will enable things like your brain to be put in a robot and you'll, you know, you'll basically be immortal. Um, and I can tell you, when I was at your university in my final year, I wrote a paper on the emerging internet, which was just going public then. People in, in the world were getting their first email. And we had just got GIF images in our Sun Solaris workstations when we were actually making so-called hyper-text <laughs> pages. I said the internet will be the way that most information is learned and disseminated. I can tell you 100% certainty, as I was then, that, this, that you will have your brain put into a robot, and that is the future of the human race. This technology, along with the end drive, will allow us to colonize the stars. It will always also allow us to arrive at a place and see what we have and make the elements we need to, to, to live the existence we need to live. Uh, it's unbelievable transformation. Um, any questions? So this could mean uh, some kind of revolution in power industry? This... So you have Battenfall, who paid for the research into the Lagara reactor. They are currently selling their lignite mines and their German power stations to either a Czech consortium or a German consortium. I mean, it, it completely changes everything. Really. I'm not sure if I which is why we do everything open and live. You can't unsee things that have been seen. So everyone's seen the step in our progress and they know how we got there. So if we're ever cut out the picture, you know, but like I say, now there are major research programs on all major continents, even in America. Uh, there's a lot of research in America, they just they don't like to admit it. In fact, Rossi is working in America, his reactor is in Florida. Can you explain one, one more time the, when you spoke about the chicken and all the egg? Oh yeah, okay, so it's a French guy. Uh, go and look up. Oh, let me find that. Look at it, it's in time. It's probably a little easier to do it. I don't know, chicken. <laughs> Friends. Mutation. Uh, a. Let's try that. There you go. Biological transplantation redirected. Uh, a French scientist, Kevin was born, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so, so he gave the, he gave potassium instead of uh, calcium. And uh, the, the chicken is effectively. Uh, fusing the hydrogen into the calcium. It's fucking insane. And this could be happening in our bodies. It's a whole new field of science, and there will be whole universities dedicated to each little aspect of this science. Like I say, it changes how you think about how the Earth works, how the solar system works, how biology works. Life takes so long to destroy. Why did it take so long for us to learn how to fly? <laughs> you don't know until you do. Some, some research was in the 50s, and then there was... Oh, no, no, I took it much before there. The, the Croatian Serbian who studied in, in Prague uh, and went to America showed in 1883 the carbon button. This is a guy called Tesla. I think it was 1883, carbon button at the Royal Society. Uh. 
Oh, well, that's not true. The check coming out there. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, this is transmutation, but there were two German scientists who did exploding wires in the 1920s, and they saw helium coming out, and they wanted to report this, and they did report it, and then all the physicists came down and said, you need to unreport this. And the Russians were doing stuff, and the, the Pons and Fleischmann started seriously looking at them, and Pons knew about electrochemistry because that was his forte. He also knew about uh, plasmons, and that was another one of his fortes. And, and so that's how they came about doing their work. For Pian Tully, it was complete serendipity. That is just a complete accident. He was doing a biology experiment, and he discovered this amazing property. And he was not trying out to find it. It's just like we weren't trying to find x-rays in our experiment. It was just like, oh shit, this, is, this happened in our data. And all of our data had been published and downloaded by other people. You can't fake it. <laughs> it's already been published before we discovered it. That's the way we work. I mean, we are the only organization to do double blind testing of our fuel and ash. So we like researchers sent to an intermediary labeled vials of fuel and ash. Then the intermediary, oh sorry, and they indexed and 256 bit encrypted their index files and published it to the web. That went to an intermediary and then they uh, uh, relabeled and encrypted their files and published it to the web. And that sent out to the labs. So the labs didn't know which researchers the material had come from. And, the, uh, and you know what? The University of Missouri came back to us and said, we found a small amount of copper in one of your samples. But it's naturally occurring isotope, so we're not going to publish it. Because it could be a contamination. Then I had to go through the whole explanation. Isn't it? This one's a bit to see! <laughs> Question? When we're talking about alchemy, don't you think that it's possible that someone in the past... In the yes, it might be possible. If they manage to create an electrochemical cell, yes. And then try to make... No, you won't make gold. You can't. You look, you look at the, the table and you can't. You can make anything if you add neutrons. You keep adding neutrons. You can make anything. So if, if the process generally adds neutrons, you will get every item. I, I they didn't break it gold, but uh, after that they maybe tried. With this process, you guarantee, there is a painter, the Mitsubishi painter, that took 13 years to get awarded. That will allow you to make platinum from tungsten. So, you know, I think it's good. <laughs> you can use it for a catalyst if you don't want it as a wedding ring. Actually, it's really small amounts. Good question? When you mentioned the EM drive, uh, I yeah. heard that there have been some uh, theories how it actually works. Could you tell us something more about it? Okay, so the EM drive, um, so Stoyan has a working um, anti gravity drive. And he said, once I've dealt with this, he's going to give me the designs for that. He has got a patent, but he didn't pay the patent fees last year, so it's now public domain, but it's going to be much easier to work with him. Essentially, what you're using is, you're using, in his understanding, some means of warping in space-time. Uh, and uh, you create, like you have a, a higher pressure under an aerofoil and a low pressure on the top, and it, it creates lift like that, you are just warping it. And that's, that's his... his uh, technology. With the M drive, you're kind of doing a similar thing. You have a cavity, a resonant cavity from microwaves, and it has a small surface at one end and a, and a bigger surface at the other, and it creates a higher pressure on this end, and it gets a and that momentum. The NASA are currently got a paper in peer review for um, publication in science or something um, of the M drive and their research. I, I've been at these conferences and I've had guys from NASA following me around like this. <laughs> I said, what are you following me for? We publish everything we do. You don't need to follow me. What about you know, some working prototypes or something? I've seen Grossi, you said about Grossi and he made a couple of years ago, he proposed that he made a working well, okay, so Rossi, like I say, he's a colourful character, he's proposed a lot of things. I don't believe anyone until I see it with my own eyes. 
So one of our researchers in France, he phoned me up a little bit nervous and he says, for the last two weeks, my leaking Chalani cell, I've had to put extra hydrogen because the, the operating temperature for that, the pressure for, of hydrogen for that experiment was three bar. And over a, a period of days, it would leak down to one bar because hydrogen is the smallest stuff you can get apart from hydrinos, which mill cells exist, which are 130 times, two times smaller there anyway. Um, hydrogen is the smallest natural thing you can get. And that leads to anything. It's a problem with hydrogen vehicles. You lose 10% of their volume in a day. And every time he was putting hydrogen in, he says, I'm seeing the counts on my Geiger counter go up two, three times. And it decays over a period of time. So I stopped what I was doing. I got on a plane and went to some front. <laughs> and I videoed it. And it does. It did. And there's a 2012 paper. So this last experiment was very good. The, 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 uh, uh, this experiment here is very good because, uh, in another way, because um, we didn't see, so the, 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 the spectrum we saw, uh, there was two very large integration periods for our scintillator. Um, one was about 20 hours, 8 hours, another one was about 20 hours. And uh, the, um, the decay time was, uh, we thought it straddled the two. Uh, and this experiment showed us that um, uh, it, there's a decay time that's much larger than most sample times. And there's a researcher called Ed Storms, and he works at the Lawrence National uh, Research Lab in, in the US. And he says the decay time for these photons, when well, whatever's happening in the nucleus, is 109 minutes. So this experiment kind of supports his theory. Now, this is what I'm saying is, I don't believe things until I see them. And Rossi is trying to uh, be judged by the market, by having a product that's ready for market. And so he's being quite secretive about what he's doing in the intervening time. Although, at the same time as trying to be secretive, he's also can't help himself but talk about it on his blog. <laughs> so, he said a lot of things in the past, and when we published the experiment closely at 5.2, we had some guy in Denmark uh, uh, analyze his blog, capture all of the data, and create a knowledge system where you put in search terms, and it finds responses to blog questions from the last six years. And we found out that he did want 62 and 64, we found out about the radiation, everything we found out from this experiment, we found out a lot of it had already said. Um, so, we can't know that he's telling the truth, we can only test and see what we see. Um, so, he's claiming a, a guarantee of about COP of 6. Uh, so, 6 times out more than you get you, the energy you put in. He's got a court case in, in the federal courts right now um, that the reactor, the 1 megawatt test, uh, produced a COP of 50, as I said earlier. Sometimes it was higher, so I, I went to speak to some Swedish politicians uh, at the end of last year and um, there were some guys that had visited him and they said at that time the, the COP was around 100. So this is an average through the entire 350 day test, something like 50, 352 days. Um, it, it produced an average of a COP of 50. So is anyone close to bring this on the market? I, I think Mills is closer with us. It's not, so Mills' technology uses one gallon of water to produce eight barrels of oil equivalent energy. And it's the, 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 the load loop is closed once it's started. So the energy generated from the solar panels, a small amount of that is used to run, run the, the three components of, of the uh, no moving parts uh, system. His previous reactor, the previous year, had literally copper cogs that it, it came in, to, it connected to each other, it was like an arc welding unit. This, the, the technology is so much better now, in one year. There will be paintings made about this technology for the next thousand years. You ask the question, why is it taking so long to come to fruition? You think about the early transistors, I mean, they only worked one in ten or one thirty times, and they were literally this big. And now you've probably got two billion in a smartphone. But they were this big. <laughs> uh, one of the researchers we work for worked for um, uh, a, a, 
a semiconductor company, a guy called Rubalba Mateo, he, he worked for a semiconductor company, and they're looking to create a version of this technology where the actual generator is actually on the chip. So the power for the chip comes from low energy nuclear reactions on the actual chip. So you don't have a battery, you don't need to charge it, it comes with the power. I mean, the, the, the technology, the logical extension is that, I mean, Mills technology, you need to keep feeding with water, but there's plenty of that. Um, uh, and the product, the silver is, uh, um, is a catalyst, so it vaporizes, condenses, rolls back down into the well, and it's used again. Um, one of the researchers, a Canadian researcher, says that his research on the sun fusion using silver. He said silver was the most difficult to do sun fusion with because it always exploded. It was always the most energetic. Um, and so he, but he did find that the, the silver converted into one isotope. So he suspects that the, the isotope will end up as one isotope. But just like in, in the Piantelli Rossi kind of reaction, the nickel 62 is fine once it's a nickel 62, it keeps working. In fact, it's better. And maybe we'll demonstrate that in our next experiment. But uh, um, yeah, so I think, I think um, the, the, the best working embodiment that you're going to see soonest is, is Mills. But it, it's only part of the energy technology, it's, 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 the, it's the eating of the electron as it comes in. Anything else? Okay. Thank you for coming.